Massachusetts for Mr. Lincoln to take the stand and give his inaugural address to the nation from Washington. The nation is in a state of panic as the relationship between the Northern and Confederate states become even more strained. We are looking back at the past decade and the events that have led up to the brink of war. Please stay tuned as we await the inauguration with a look back at the former segments from the past several years. a compromise was made to diffuse confrontations between the free North states and the slave states of the South over new land that America had received from the Mexican War. Let's take a look back at the coverage of this event. President Millard Fillmore, along with Congress, had to make a major decision today as California petitioned the government to join the Union as a free state. Admitting California as a free state would throw off the balance of 15 free states and 15 slave states. We now go on location to tell us what the decision is. I'm here talking with Senator Danielle Webster to talk about what happened. So Mr. Webster, is California a free state? California is a free state, um, but there were many new laws and agreements made to keep the South happy. What kind of compromises are we talking about here? Agreements that could affect us up in Massachusetts? Yes and no. Um, we had to pass a few, uh, new Fugitive Slave Act, um, which means that if you are sending a home and, run and a runaway slave comes wandering through your yard, you must, by law, catch and return the slave to its rightful owner. Mm -hmm. This applies to any slave, whether they are free for years or just escaped. Along with the Fugitive Slave Act, what other types of agreements were made? Um, new Mexico and Utah are now using the slave issue uh, by popular sovereignty, um, which gives actual settlers a chance to vote. Texas will receive $10 million from the federal government for its loss and the slave trade in the District of Columbia is abolished. Well, there you have it, folks. If you have an opinion on this compromise, please call our hotline at 444-3344. Now back to you in the studio. After this short break, we will be answering your phone calls. Could switching to GEICO really save you 15% or more on car insurance? Was Abe Lincoln honest? Does this dress make my backside look big? Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Old party allegiance and ties. Mr. Lincoln, you may reply. Would the good people like a reply? I said, would the good people like a reply? Yeah! I'll give you a reply. You think that's surprising? Get this. Diet Dew has all the intensity of regular Dew with none of the calories. Hello, now we're back and we're accepting your phone calls. Hello, who am I speaking with? Hi, this is Gaspar Albert from Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I would like to say that this Fugitive Slave Act is a piece of baloney. If a slave is free, you shouldn't have to send him or her back to the slave driver they came from. If they got away from you, it's your own dang fault. Using people to do your dirty work is unconstitutional, and we should just stop all this nonsense and send, sla sla <laughs> send slaves back to Africa, where they belong. Thank you for your call. Hello, caller number two. Hi. I would like to agree with Jasper. I've had free slaves come through my house for about five years now, and turning them in would just break my little heart. The South needs to stop whining about their runaway slaves and keep the ones they have in check. Thank you, callers, for your time. It seems the issue has been resolved for the time being. Before 1852, much of the debate with over slavery was political rather than ethical. However, when a radical abolitionist novel was published, it changed the nature of the argument. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe began to lay the groundwork for a pending conflict that we are in the midst of today. So is a Connecticut-born teacher at Har the Hartford Female Academy and an active abolitionist. The novel is centered around Uncle Tom, an, an older black slave, and the characters that surround him. It depicts the, hor the horrible reality of slavery while asserting Christianity and love. It truly brings the reader into the world of slavery, and it creates emotional bond with the main character. Uncle Tom's cabin outraged Southerners, who refused to admit to the horror of slavery. It was deemed utterly false, criminal, and even slanderous. However, in the North, the book elicited praise and became a bestseller. 
And now a word from our sponsors. After the break, the Kansas Nebraska Act and the terror of bleeding Kansas in 1854. On the next edition of Extreme Makeover Classroom Edition, we're here in our U.S. classroom. Look how horrible it is. It looks so much better. <laughs> See, I wrote this book, and I have no idea what it's about. I just wrote and wrote and wrote until it filled the book. People bought it. I don't know. <laughs> Due to the recent activities happening in Kansas, the state has now become known as Bleeding Kansas. The term has become a sensation across the country. This battle between the pro-slavery and the anti-slavery population is a result of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. Our reporter is outside waiting to inform us of the current happenings. Turmoil has taken over the city citizens of Kansas. Violent, merciful people are merciless people are flooding into the streets. But why are these people so upset? Sir, sir, excuse me, sir. Would you like to answer a few questions? Okay. What are your views on the violent acts of the northerners? Personally, I feel that we have a right to be angry. The South felt that they <laughs> <laughs> take over Kansas, but they know better. They should know that we, as Northerners, aren't giving up without a fight. The John Brown murders resulted beca because of the sacking of, the, of Lawrence. Do you think that the killings could be considered cruel and maybe an overreaction? <laughs> um, I agree with the motivation behind the murders. I also agree that the actual act, because of the South pillars the city, of course we are going to strike back with violence. I understand that killing the individuals might have added fuel to the fire, but it was a justification of the Southern actions. Do you think the South has gotten the hint to allow the state to be free, even after the murders? If they haven't received any hints yet, they're going to until a massive war breaks out. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Coming straight from a Northerner, the South has been warned. The North isn't joking around about the subject of slavery. I would interview a southerner, but I don't seem to see any around. Could they be in hiding? Back to you, Amber, in the studio. Thank you. President Franklin Pierce is against the riots in the North. Congress has been asked by the President to admit Kansas in as a slave state. Something tells me that the North is not going to stand by and accept that. From Washington today, Senator Charles Sumner was viciously attacked by South Carolina Representative Preston S. Brooks on the floor of the Senate chamber. While Senator Sumner was sitting at his desk writing letters, Brooks repeatedly hit him with a walking cane, which eventually splintered due to the force of the strikes. Representative Brooks reportedly said, You have libelled my state and slandered my relation, who is aged and absent, and I feel it to be my duty to punish you. After the speech, he began his vengeful attack which could ultimately lead to serious consequences regarding Representative Brooks' job as well as his voice in government. <laughs> Even though two House members intervened to end the attack, Sumner, who had become trapped in his folded down desk, was beaten unconscious. he was able to regain consciousness, but will not be able to resume his congressional duties for quite some time. This attack comes three days after Sumner delivered a speech denouncing the institution of slavery. Representative Brooks apparently saw the speech as an abomination and an insult, as it targeted three individual senators, one being his uncle, Andrew Butler. As he returns to his home state of South Carolina, he will more than likely be welcomed as a hero instead of a felon. Thank you. That's the news from the North. With the Dred Scott decision at hand, something even more controversial has arisen to fuel the conflict regarding slavery. Stephen A. Douglas, a Democrat running for president, has been active in political debates since August 21st with Abraham Lincoln, the first Republican candidate for president. Today, in Freeport, Illinois, in the second 
of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, the resolution of the controversy over the issue of popular sovereignty was a major topic while the Dred Scott decision also came up. Douglas has tried to revive popular sovereignty by proposing that slavery should legally be excluded from all territories by local legislation, that wish to simply refuse to enact an institution of slavery. This matter of popular sovereignty that was previously rejected in the Dred Scott decision by Chief Justice Roger B. Taney is now being approved. The extensive attention the doctrine is reviving, receiving could split up the Democratic Party and seriously ruin Douglas's little support he has in the South for presidency in 1860, but definitely will secure Douglas's re-election to the Senate by his dedicated Illinois followers. Stephen Douglas for one of Illinois state Senate seats has finally come to an end. If you remember the debates occurred in seven towns of the state. The two men appeared in these places in order of appearance. Ottawa on August 21st, Freeport on August 27th, Jonesboro on September 15th, Charleston on September 18th, Galesburg on October 7th, Quincy on October 13th, and Alton on December 15th. Every debate began with the first person speaking for an hour and then the second person speaking for an hour and a half, then ending with the first person again in the rejoinder with half an hour to speak. The method alternated with each debate area. The major debates that drew especially large numbers of people from the neighboring states were in Freeport with an estimated 15,000 people, Quincy with an estimated 10,000 people, and Alton with an estimated 5,000 people. Although throughout most of the debate, Slavery was the key issue. Some memorable responses such as the Freeport Doctrine surfaced. This occurred in the second debate where Lincoln attempted to force Douglas to choose between the principles of popular sovereignty proposed by the Kansas-Nebraska Act and the majority decision of the United States Supreme Court in the case of Dred Scott v. Stanford. Douglas's response stated that despite the court's ruling, slavery could be prevented from any territory by the refusal of the people living in that territory. This response is now known as the Freeport Doctrine. With the termination of the debates, the winner of the Illinois Senate seat was Stephen Douglas. Thank you. 